Welcome back, it is Friday and this is part three of the Q&A and my answers to all of your awesome questions. So let's get straight into it. I got a ton of questions left, so I'm gonna try to power through all these a bit faster so we can end this with part three, unless there has to be a part four because there are too many awesome questions. So let me sit here, right? Look at my monitor, I'm here, so there's room as always for these. So eight animator or however you pronounce that, um, power centers and poses, that's what I talked about last time or said that's gonna be uh, the answer for today. So with power centers, um, so you understand the examples so actually, let me read the question for people that are just listening. Power centers and poses. I understand some of the examples given about this topic, but I can't find a logical pattern to this concept when comparing between examples. Well, I'm not sure if there's a logical pattern, um, you know, where it's like a mathematical thing of this is how it's supposed to be. But I would say, I would look at power centers in terms of the attitude, right? So when you have someone, I was kind of thinking in terms of like Chris Farley, who's kind of big and doesn't really care about how big he is. And to me, like his power center is kind of the hips and the belly area where that's just the area that leads. Even when he's in a rest pose, it's kind of like, er, that's how he is. Versus someone could be maybe skinnier and lighter and more cerebral. And maybe the power center would be then in the head, whereas like the head is always kind of leading the thing. You know, it's kind of moving around as if it's being pulled by something or... Again, it could be something in the chest, depending how powerful and confident you are, or the head, or the hips. So to me, power centers would be something where uh, it's the general attitude of the character uh, that's throughout everything. So in the stress pose, in between you know, specific acting beats, that's always kind of the defining pose and attitudes and line of action, just in you know, the way the character is throughout anything. So that's kind of how I see power center in poses. And you can look at it in terms of, is a character weak or strong, and then how will that adjust your power pose depending on that so that it, that will be emphasized. So someone, you know, that's shy and introverted wouldn't really have a power center here. Um, you give me out of frame here, but where, you know, constantly out like that, be unless, you know, maybe they're pretending and that's the thing. And then whenever they're, no one's looking, that it gets more into like, that's kind of more how they are. I mean, that's kind of how I look at it. Um, but I'll definitely want to look into that more. Uh, it's not really something that I think about specifically where I say, well, this is the power center that I want. For me, it's always kind of, what's the attitude of the character? What is the defining rest pose? That's, you know, the, the definition of the character when they're just in their default pose. Uh, and then what are the attitudes depending on the shot and the story points and the, you know, the emotions you want to convey in that shot specifically. Um, so if that can be applied to power centers, then that's fine too. But it's actually not something that I, I think about frequently in those terms. Um, but yeah, again, thank you for the question. Hesitature. Hesitature? 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 <laughs> I love those names. Uh, hi, JD. Thank you for all your videos. You're very welcome. They are extremely helpful. That's awesome. I have a few questions. Of course, working on animation involving a lot of revisions. There is always fixing and changing idea. How do you manage your scene or blocking so that it's easier to change? Yes, that is definitely a topic, especially at work. We definitely have an environment where there are a lot of revisions. So I basically, what I do is my workflow, knowing if, if I present it to someone, knowing that there's going to be a lot of, you know, changes and revisions and stuff and notes. Um, I usually, uh, I think, as I mentioned before, I block things out every four frames. So I do, I block, I key the whole character, including face and fingers, but you know, like basic stuff and I strip maybe keys I don't need, but the, everything on the character, every four frames with the main poses with the, about the right timing that I want. And then I adjust those keys in a timeline to move around so that the timing is correct and it looks good and the weight is there and the, the story points are clear, the acting beats are clear. Uh, and I try to incorporate offsets and asymmetry, just make it as good as possible but as cleanly as I can with those clean keys. And then, you know, if I need to do something in between where I go from that into layered, where maybe I go now root, chest, head, arms, and legs, and I kind of, I'm a bit more messier uh, with the keys. If I need more detail, then that I, then I do that. But then that's kind of how I present it. Uh, hopefully it's clean enough. And if there are notes, because everything is keyed on the, on the same frame on all the uh, controllers, I can easily just delete keys uh, and then readjust and, you know, and then go from there. Um, if it gets where I have too many keys, because we got to present it in a, in a more advanced stage, you know, I just usually just key 
Like if I have a middle part that's not good, that needs changes, I key at the end of what's good, and then I key everything at the end uh, of, of what was not good. And that middle chunk, I just delete the whole thing, and the rest stays put. And then I put in the new animation, and then I make sure that the blend points are okay. So whatever was good, then the new part, and then whatever was good before, and I kind of blend that. Worst case, when everything is just, there's too much stuff in there, I just bake the whole character. Baking as in I key every frame, every control, everything is there, no constraints, everything's just boom, there. Then I can just delete a chunk, it's not gonna affect anything, readjust and maybe delete a couple keys before and after, you know, to kind of make the splines look good, and that's kind of the approach. So I'm pretty comfortable at this point to just baking things out and just deleting chunks and re going in there and readjusting and then making the, tra the transitions uh, work out. And sometimes, you know, you got revisions that are so destructive you just start from scratch, <laughs> you just gotta redo it. Um, so that's kind of how I do it. So my blocking is as clean as possible for uh, as many changes um, that I can fit in quickly. Is there always subtext in every shot in a film? After watching your videos, I have been trying to put subtext in my animation, but I have a hard time coming up with a subtext or with subtext on some shot that the character says something straightforward or say something that he is actually thinking. For example, a character just broke a coffee machine and then people are looking at him, he say, I didn't do anything. So no, there is not always subtext. You can absolutely do whatever you said here where it's just a, a full on, no, I didn't do it. And that's it. And sometimes it's just more interesting where the character looks around and goes, no, I didn't do it. But you clearly know that they did and they're trying to hide it. So I think subtext is just interesting to do because there's, there's more, there's another layer to the performance and there's more interest to it. Um, and you can add some subtleties in there. Um, but at the same time, you no, know, you don't need it. Some shots are just very straightforward. So, so no, you don't always need subtext. I've seen a progression reel from a professional animators, right, from professional animators who shoot acting reference and then animate the character exactly the same as the reference. However, I had a hard time acting out to get a perfect reference where I can just copy it into my animation. What is the best way to practice to get perfect reference or is there any other solution? It's a tricky one um, because it depends on your style. So if anybody listening to this has the attitude that reference is cheating, then it's not cheating. So I just want to just put the hammer down on that. It's pretty silly that you don't want to shoot reference. Why wouldn't you? Everybody uses reference. It's You learn from reference. You don't have to copy it. You can still shoot reference and learn from the basics, the principles, the mechanics of how do I really move and then take what you learn and then tweak it and, and stylize it and, and, and caricature it. You mean like it, just, it doesn't have to be a copy. That being said, so if some animators copy the reference exactly, which I have done as well, because sometimes in my line of work, it's for the real and it has to be super clean. I remember doing a shot for Battleship where there's a shark coming towards camera around a silo, like one of those ships that are on the water and then that's it. But then they wanted a very specific move that was based on reference. And they wanted exactly that. So, well, I just copied that animation one-to-one -one, and it's just a, every four frames, every two frames, every one frame, and then you just copy and that's, it's, it's a facsimile of that reference. And then so be it because it has to be for the real. But then they extended the shot before and after so it became twice as long. So then the beginning was keyframe, then it was reference, and then it was keyframe. So I looked at the reference, I looked at other reference, I studied how sharks move, and then I put that in so it's kind of from scratch then it's reference, and then it's from scratch, and then with notes from the supervisor who knew a lot more about animals, give me tips, and then at the end it's one whole cohesive piece. So sometimes you copy it one to one, like on I did the shot on uh, Pirates 2, just one shot on a weekend, uh, and it was Davy Jones, and it's just the performance is so good by the actor, and that's what they wanted, you just copy that performance one to one. Creatively, it's just, it's there's nothing there, there's nothing that you contribute. Um, but sometimes just that's the work. So to answer your question, um, the best way to practice to get perfect reference is that you A, have, have to first look at what is the intent of the shot and what is the style. If it's cartoony, then you're not gonna reference, uh, copy the reference because then what's the point? Like it's gonna be too real looking. You wanna stylize and push anticipation, push the ideas, push the acting, and the reference is gonna be just a jumping off point, right? Looking at maybe specific timing points for, for a gesture or a head turn, or just specific poses, or how you move from pose to pose, and then you embellish on top of that. So you gotta look at first your style and intent, and then you reference, it just comes down to, well, if you're bad at shooting reference, then you gotta find someone else that's better at acting things out. 
Or if you're bad, maybe you're better at interpreting your reference and then thumbnailing and going from there. So for me, there's no perfect reference in me. I mean, it's, it depends how good you are. Like the structure has to be good. So if you're not good at reference, find someone that's better. Um, but your reference has to, it's just the starting block. I know if that makes sense, right? So your your reference, if you got a cartoony shot, your shot, you, you won't be able to act it out exactly the way it's supposed to be because I highly doubt that you can move exactly in a full on cartoony way. So it's not going to be perfect. So I think you just have to live with that. <laughs> you just have to make it work and then use that as, as the basic structure and, and then, you know, improve on that. Uh, or is there any other solution? So yeah, that's, so that's what I mentioned. Uh, again, what I use sometimes in reference is just that I copy the reference. I rotoscope it every four frames just to get a general idea of is my timing right? Is the, the general idea right within the time frame with the live action play? If it needs, if it's, if that's what I have in my shot or with the camera move or the scale of the creature, like whatever it is, like sometimes I just do that quickly to see, is that the right idea? And if it is, then I know what to do, what not to do. And then I shoot, shoot reference again, more specifically, uh, and then it can be more stylized and more whatever, or it's the same where I just do something real, realizing the timing of it. And then the animation is more stylized and just, I just take elements out of reference. So for me, if I shoot reference for live action, um, sometimes I stick to it very closely. Sometimes I throw it all away and it's just, you know, basic reference. If I shoot reference for cartoony stuff, most of the times 80% goes out the window. I just look at general poses, the idea, maybe I like a head turn, but then you look at it and you go, well, that head turn just looks real. It doesn't have the right arc, the, the right settle or the right moving hold. And then that's something you just got to do by hand. You know, it's just the keyframe aspect of it. All right. I'd like to request a video about texture in animation. How do you get an interesting timing out of your performance? Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, I definitely will talk about timing, uh, and then texture for me that goes hand in hand, how to kind of look at, and for me, it's kind of like the flow. It's almost a musical thing, how you have movements and changes. So I always look at contrast. Contrast is huge for me. Contrast and timing and timing in general, I almost put that above, uh, poses. Yes. Poses are super important. Um, but you can have great poses and really bad timing. It's going to fall flat. But if you have fantastic timing with crappy poses, it's still going to be better than great poses and bad timing. Because with bad timing, the intent is off, the acting choice is off. You won't quite understand what it means. But even with crappy poses, the timing of it for the comedy or the intensity, all that stuff comes, is still visible through the timing. So texture and animation, timing and contrast, that's huge. So, okay, I will definitely uh, look at that and then do something uh, specifically. All right. Uh, oh, hi, Mark. Uh, he's got a question. Hi, JD. Actually, we should thank you for your videos here. Oh, please. It's my pleasure. Um, but thank you. If you have some time, take a look at this video. Uh, yes, I believe that was the lessons lessons of the screenplay or something. Um, I, I apologize for blanking. I definitely watched those. It talks about screenplay, but also mentioned about acting and character habits. My question is, I think that might have been... Um, no country for old men, maybe, I don't know. But um, check in the previous uh, video, he posted that question, the link is there. It's great and I love that that channel, it's awesome stuff. My question is, how to add these little personal habits to a character, but not to complicate the original idea? Thank you so much for all the videos, especially acting and analysis. You're very welcome and I love that you like those. Um, so, how to add these little personal habits to characters, but not to complicate the original idea? That's a great question and I would say, my answer to that would be, don't add those personal habits. I know this goes against everything I just said in, in everything that I just posted. The point is that you need to have very clear acting beats, acting choices, uh, the timing, just everything has to be super clear to, to um, communicate the idea and the story point and the acting choices, right? So the cleaner this can be and the simpler and the more direct, to me at least, the better. The moment you start adding personal habits and things, like you said, it can start to complicate the idea. So I would do the general structure and make that as clearly as you can and then just as cleanly as you can. And if you have a moment where maybe I can just add that little thing here. And I know it's technically, well, you shoot reference, you plan that little moment in there and it should be in your original blocking. Maybe it's tricky to do just the basic stuff and then add stuff on top of that. I totally understand. But if you want to be safe, keep it clean, keep it direct, keep it just, you know, very focused. Then you can add maybe little things here and there just to add that little habit, to add that little extra thing in there. And it's just kind of up to you to kind of police yourself until, you know, so you kind of have to look at, is that too complicated? And if you're unsure, you got to ask for feedback because you can't 
work in a vacuum. You got to ask for feedback. So ask your teacher, ask your mentor, ask your coworkers, ask your fellow animators, students, you know what I mean? Like whatever you have for feedback, um, just ask and go, is this clear? And when it's not clear, strip it out and redo it until everything is clear. And it's kind of like, for me, like the personal habits, all that stuff is kind of the salt and pepper and the spices where it's the added flavor. But if the general structure is not clear, then it's not going to work either way. But I understand what you mean that what if you add too much and it complicates it? Again, that just goes into feedback. So add things, see how it works, ask for feedback until it breaks. You're like, I don't get this. Like, okay, well then I, maybe I should dial back and not do that. All right, that would be my answer to that. Cecilia Tedia, Tedja, I don't know, I apologize, as always. Uh, one, I always have a problem where my animation poses don't overlap well, which make my animation so stiff, especially when the movement is not action. Do you have any tips how we overlap one-on-one? Yes, um, I would say, it's a good question because I, I do a lot of things pose to pose because if I have a set length of a shot, I want to know, can I fit all the acting beats into that length? And then I kind of do pose to pose. So I know I need to do this here, this in frame 50, this in frame 100. Can I fit this in? How are the in-betweens and the different acting choices in between? Will it fit? And that's so a lot of times my, my workflow is pose to pose. But then you have that where it's just kind of, you know, that's the pose. So how do you overlap? So for me, the overlap is... There are, two, there are two ways. Overlap in sense of just the action overlaps in terms of you do something and then the action overlaps, you know, copy hair, secondary stuff, or hat, coats, you know, something that's just there, the movement that overlaps. But there's the second part where that's to be more interesting is you have to look at when you go from a pose and you go to the other pose, you have to look at what's the intent, what's just the acting choice and what will lead that acting choice. Is your pose A going to pose B led by the head? Is it led by the hand? Is it led by the chest, the knee, whatever it is, right? So if I'm talking to someone and I hear a sound that freaks me out, it might be, whoa, what was that? And I look and I lead with the head. So for me, the overlap, maybe it's not exactly overlap because you have a set pose and you go into something else, but this could be where I do something and then I go into another pose and that would be the overlap from pose to pose. You know what I mean? So I, that's kind of how I approach it. So it could be something where I turn like this. If I talk and maybe someone is saying something that's that's annoying, I might lead with the hand first, shh, and then I do that. So, so animation poses. So that's kind of how I look at it, uh, how I take this question. Like if the poses don't overlap well, you have to look at two things. Are there overlaps in terms of technical overlaps where you stop something and then another action just overlaps and you have secondary stuff? Not in terms of secondary of I'm doing something, shuffling through things, secondary action as I deliver the, my acting choices but it's kind of like overshoot and overlaps in terms of, uh, you know, again, like a coat, a scarf, hair, or, or a tie. So that's just kind of more of a technical thing. So I'm not sure if that's what you mean in this case, but the stiff animation, I take it also in terms of, I have an acting choice pose. I have an acting choice pose. I have an acting choice pose. That to me also makes it stiff. So I look at it in terms of what you want to do going from A to B pose wise and what will lead the action and that will be based on your acting intent or in a reaction to something or whatever it is, right? So I hope that makes sense. So I look at, again, is it something external? I look and that's something that I go through here. Is it something that I do with my arms to stop something? Or is it, you know, I look at someone and then I go over there so that maybe the shoulders will lead more and then the head and so on. So that's kind of how I look at that. So, um, because you say, especially when the movement is not action. So that's kind of how I take it in terms of acting choices and not action in terms of mechanic, mechanical movement. I don't know. If that wasn't clear and I took that question in the wrong way, let me know, comment, and then I will clarify. Two, can you tell us how to create a good reference, especially for acting? I try to animate based on my references, but they don't come out very well because my acting is poorly executed. Sometimes I just move the movement, doesn't match. Wait, sometimes I just move? but the movement doesn't match the conversation or simply my movement is too simple, just like the default human, um, just like the default human, ha ha ha. So I think I talked a lot about reference. I hope whatever I mentioned in my long time post, how to look at reference and in my Q and A's now, I elaborate a lot on reference. I hope that was an answer. Um, I tried to animate based on my reference, but it don't come out very well because my acting is poorly. It really comes back to if you can't act, find someone that can act for you or you look at actors and, and moments in movies as inspiration, don't copy them, 
but you can see how they go about it and then take notes and thumbnails and kind of try to distill the good stuff and, you know, combine that into a, a movement for you. Um, so, yeah. And, you know, again, it's like too simple. It's not complex enough in terms of acting choices. Study acting, look at actors, what do they do? Uh, and if you find people around you in your community, in your school, whatever, that are good actors, study them, ask them how they go about it. Uh, and it's just, it's just a matter of practice as well. Three, how do we make a reference for action shot like jumping, parkour, etc., but we can't do it? Um, that's a good question as well, because sometimes you are not able to do all that jumping and stuff. So then I look at outside reference, go on YouTube or whatever you can find online. People probably have done what you need. And if it becomes too much, then in terms of like something that's not realistic or just something that no one has ever done, look at, well, is there a basic thing that's within that action that I can look at and then base my action on that. So if the jump is there, but the jump that is needed for your shot is even crazier, start with the thing that's real, that's based on, on proper mechanics that don't feel fake, and then embellish on that. And because that way your structure is real. Like a structure, your body mechanics make sense. It's not something that breaks where you go like, I don't buy this, but you can then embellish moments to kind of push the style or push the action, if that makes sense. So I check online and then like, as always, if everything fails, just gotta make it up, right? Sometimes you just gotta create it from scratch and you just do it and you hope that whatever you've learned by now will make your mechanics work and sometimes you just gotta, again, do it from scratch. All right? Tanya Doodlezilla Vincent. Hi, I would love to hear your tips for animating in layers versus stepped. I love working in stepped, but layers is a bit terrifying. Do you have any advice? Also, I'd love to hear your tips on animating acting while the character is doing a mechanical act such as a scene with the character walking and talking. How would you approach this? Love the channel and the tips. Thank you. Thank you for spending this time to teach us all. You are very welcome. All right, let's go one by one. Hi, I would love to hear about tips uh, animating layers versus stepped. I love working in stepped, but layers is a bit terrifying. All right, I got lots of thoughts and I've mentioned that before in previous uh, Q&As and other stuff, but I'm gonna say it again here. Um, I would, so my big thing, if you do stepped, which actually I just talked about in the class yesterday at the academy, if you do stepped, the main thing is that you got to be very disciplined about adding enough breakdowns in between, ease ins and outs, to really show the timing of someone, of how someone transitions from pose to pose. So if someone is standing and then gets up, you can't have just a pose like this, and then it pops to the pose of the character standing because you're missing all the good stuff in between. Well, how is the character standing? Is it just kind of like a slow, or is it like a, oh, what's going on? Is it kind of like, hey, you, when it gets up? There are so many things in between that you can do that will tell us what the character feels. So add more breakdowns when you do step mode, right? Uh, so that's my first thing about um, stepped. Layers would be, I, I'm more in the layers, I don't do stepped, but I prefer the, the kind of the pose to pose, like my structure is post to pose, like I said, every four frames, whatever, it's mostly four frames. Uh, the general structure, post to pose, and then I go layered. And for layered, I look at what is the body part that's going to influence the rest of the, uh, the, the rig the most. And for me, that's the root. And everything has to work out of the root. The weight, the shifts, everything is going to be dictated by that. So that has to work. And sometimes you can just turn off arms, you can turn off legs and heads, and just have a stump the torso with the hips, and that can kind of just move. It's like sometimes you have complicated actions. Instead of your rig, you put in the sphere and you put in the cube, uh, and then they kind of move, like a little toy. That's my camera battery, and I can go, and that's the animation. And if the timing's there and the movements and the weight, that's the right structure. And then on top of that, then I'm gonna add the chest, where the head, uh, the root and the chest are maybe more overlapping and broken up. And then once that is done, I take the head because when you move the root, it's gonna move the chest. When you move the chest, it's gonna move the head. Once that is done, you can start moving the head, you can start moving the arms and legs. That being said, sometimes you have actions where you wanna lead with the head first, and then you gotta do the head first, and then the chest, and then the root because the head takes everything with it. So sometimes it's just kind of a back and forth. So I would look at general structure, pose to pose, general structure in layers in terms of root, chest, head, because it's just the basic stuff. The root just has to work. And then you can go into, okay, well, what's really going through, you know, the pose changes. Again, maybe the arm, the arm is leading and that will take the shoulder, that will take the chest, and that's gonna change your, your mechanics. So it's there's a lot of back and forth. So for me, there's nothing really clean. Uh, I try to be as clean as I can, like I said, in my every four frames. 
but it's still going to be messy. So every four frames might be clean, but once I go layered, I animate the way it's supposed to look right. And that means I can have key, 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 pause, key, 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 all keys on every frame if it's something tricky on fingers and wrists. So then if I look at the timeline and I select the whole character, my timeline might be completely red, right? So I start clean, but then once I go layered, it's just gonna be, this has to work. Especially during polish where you go, well now this arc of the, of the elbow, of the shoulder, the nose tip, the sword tip, you're gonna have so many keys that at the end it's just gonna be messy. And then if I need to tweak it, like I said before, I just key here, key here, delete the whole thing in between and then work on changes. Um, but so that's kind of my piece of advice there. Uh, I'll, I'll also, excuse me, also I'd love to hear your tips on animating acting while a character is doing a mechanical act such as the scene with the character walking, talking. That's massively difficult and I totally understand that question. Um, so for me personally, subjectively, again, this is ask other people, every workflow is different. I will really look at what is the basic structure of the walk, the direction, the tempo of it, the speed. Um, and I would definitely shoot reference in terms of how I act while I do this, but I might be very rough with my roots and the legs to work out where they are and the steps and the pauses. Uh, and I kind of do that as a main structure first. I don't really worry about chest and hand and the acting choices, but I want that to be very roughly clear. Then I go into the acting beats where someone might be walking and have a little pause, like, wait, hold on. Like that little pause, I definitely want to do that first so I know when that stops. But if there's specific, hmm, with a little extra step for that change and then it goes back into walking, that just gets worked into the shot on top of that. And I got to tweak and delete some things and then on and on and on and on. So I start basic to it's clear and to kind of build on top of things to make it more and more complex to make that acting work, be it with step changes, weight shifts, an arm move, maybe a walk where someone goes, hey, and then that wave is definitely going to change the chest, change the root and the balance. So maybe there's like an offset step. So even though my basic structure was a straight walk, when I do, hey, and I do this, you might have to tweak the leg to do a little sidestep and then you come back into your original path. So then I just work that on top of the structure. And sometimes it's, it's destructive, meaning I delete and redo that part or it's enough where you can have everything's done and you use animation layers, or if you have a rig with extra controllers, you could do it on that extra layer controller. I add that change so the basic structure is there, but you just add that change and it goes back into the original structures. You kind of fade in and out of your layers or your, your controllers, how however it is set up, right? Um, so that would be it. So um, as with everything animation-wise, it's messy. Um, so that's my approach in terms of keeping it clean as long as I can until it just becomes messy. And for me, at the end, it's messy. Um, and I don't really care because if the structure is clean and the basis is good, then I'm okay adding messy things because if I take things out, the basic underlying structure is still there and clean, if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah. All right. Next up, we have Cecilia Teja. Oh, another question. I have another question about graph editor, if you don't mind. I do use graph editor when I'm animating basic objects such as a bouncing ball, a falling cube, or a pendulum, but I am having a hard time to apply those concepts when animating more complex subjects. Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, humanoid characters, animals, etc. Because of the amounts of controllers they have, and it confuses me as to which tangents of each individual controllers should I tweak, especially when using an IK controller. Do you have any tips and tricks to share on how to use the graph editors when animating an action or action, uh, an acting or action scene? Thank you, sir. You're very welcome. That's a great question. Uh, and again, this is going to be very subjective because I don't spend that much time in the graph editor. I don't really use it that much. I know this sounds super weird, but hear me out. Like you said, if it's a bouncing ball, a falling cue, a pendulum, anything that's easy and lightweight and I can play in real time, which is very rare, uh, I absolutely go into the graph editor because it's much easier because you can see it. You can tweak the curves and go in there and see what, how you know how, the, how it affects the character, the rig, the ball, the, the cube, whatever it is. Absolutely, I go into the graph editor. But because I don't really work with bouncing balls that much, it's mostly complex characters and heavy characters. Um, I completely, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. It's, it gets very complicated. But that being said, people do it uh, and it works and they can just do all the offsets in the graph editor with the curves. They have very clear visual understanding of what's going on. For me so far, my workflow and what I've done and it works for me is that I work in offsets, I work in asymmetry, I work in all that stuff into the pose. So if there's someone jumping in the landing and you want offset legs, it's not this. 
that's my pose. So all my almost contact points where you have full extension on your push off, full extension on your landing, that's the pose that I key, right? So it's not gonna be something where it's like this and then I go into the graph header and then I change the curves for the leg so it's like this. I put that into the pose. And then I look at the render view and I pose it out to that view. Then I check the 3D space so that it's actually legal and, and not cheated. If it's at work because of muscle sim, uh, you know, cloth sim, hair, whatever it is, or physics that come with that shot. If it's at home and something cartoony, I still kind of check so it's not completely broken, but if I need to cheat the camera, you cheat the camera. If it's cartoony, it's okay. Uh, and if your rig supports it as well. And sometimes you cheat something and then you got shadows and the shadow reveals the cheat, also not a good idea. But so it depends on your style again. Um, but that's what I do. I go into the actual pose and on that frame, I work in the offsets, the asymmetry and all that good stuff. So um, that's how I do it. So hopefully that uh, answers your question. And it's the same thing with IK controllers. Uh, I mostly use IK. I'm very used to because the rigs at work have IK. Um, and it's just, I'm faster with posing out IK. Uh, sometimes for clean arcs or an action like this, IK is a pain in the butt. Um, but then you can maybe switch or you can always find a way to get that art clean. There's more keys or there's some other tricks you can do. Um, so for me, it's the same thing. I care or not, uh, I pose it out in the scene and don't really do all the posing in a graph editor. So far, it's it has worked. Also, because if I move something in the graph editor, you wait and wait and wait, then the rig updates and go, okay, well, maybe not that. And it's, I feel like I slow down in my workflow. So I prefer to just pose it in the, in the pose on that frame and then go through that and kind of model and sculpt my posing through that. I don't know, it makes sense. Hopefully it makes sense. Um, Samuel. Hello, Jean-Denis. Thank you for uh, writing, Jean-Denis. First of all, thank you for your such great content. You're very welcome. Sorry if my question seems stupid. Of course not, or obvious. But what do you think about drawing thumbnails or doing 2D blocking before getting into 3D animation software? Would you recommend to draw poses and try to find great timing in 2D? Or can it be seen like a waste of time, especially if you can't draw really well? And that leads me to another question. If you work as an animator in a studio, are you usually free to work like you used to? For instance, if you were used to draw before getting into the 3D software, or even if you are used to do your blocking in spline, or, and your teammate are in stepped. What? Or even if you are used to do your blocking in spline, or, and your teammate are in stepped. Do you have to follow the studio's habits so that they have more control or are you free to work the way you want as long as good job is done? Congratulations for the 2K subscribers. Thank you. I wish you the best. Thank you very much. All right. So this can be very easily answered, kind of. Um, so it's A, it's not stupid and it's not obvious. So what do I think about drawing thumbnails or doing 2D blocking before getting into 3D? Absolutely do it. I don't because I can't draw. I love to draw, I love the feeling of a pencil and getting that stuff and seeing, especially 2D animation, seeing your drawings come alive, love it. But I'm so bad at drawing. I used to be okay, I mean, not really, but I used to do it a lot as a kid, uh, but then I kind of forgot about it. I forgot about it, but I'm just not good at it. So kind of, I'm not the one that constantly draws and practices, even though I should. Um, so I don't do it because my drawings confuse me, right? I got an idea, I put it on paper, and I go, what the hell is this? So I just pose it out right away so I can kind of, pose it on the on the rig, right? So if you can draw, then do it. It's, you know, take your dry erase marker, right? And then draw it on screen. You gotta pose it, not right, draw on screen, and like that's better than just your rig according to your drawing. So if that's what you can do, it's great. If you plan out the whole thing in 2D, that's great too. That's so much faster than plucking it out in 3D. So if that's what you can do, yes, absolutely do it. Would you recommend to draw poses? Yes, and try to find great timing in 2D? Yes. Or can it be seen like a waste of time? No, especially if you can't draw really well. Maybe. <laughs> because I can't draw well. It's a waste of time for me. And that leads me to another question. If you work as an animated studio, are you usually free to work like you used to? Yes. For, as you work on your own, sure. Once you present it, usually you present things in a very cohesive, in a, in a clean way where like everybody presents something the same way. Maybe the client is asking for a specific way. You know, it's, it usually has to be just very clear. Like, we, like It's tricky to show stepped animation in front of a live action background that's clean and smooth. So things pop, that's, that might be confusing to people. So it's just a specific way that we present things. Um, so you wouldn't really present 2D, but you can present that to your lead or your soup as a quick blocking to get a buy off on the idea and then you go in and do it 3D. So yes, absolutely. 
Um, for instance, if you work uh, through software, so that's what I just said, totally okay to do blocking and spline, blah, blah, and step. Yeah, if you have a different method to just present ideas and pitches, just ask, you know, like, is that okay to show you like this? You probably won't show it to the client, uh, but maybe you are. I don't know, I would just ask and see what people have done before. Uh, do you have to follow the studio's habits so they have more control? It's not a, an issue of control. It's, a, it's an issue of presentation like so that the presentation is clear to the client, right? So anything that's confusing is not gonna be presented. If it's internal and it works and people can decipher your, your drawings, that's fine and then you can just move on. But again, I would ask, I would ask how the studio works and how, like how the structure works within your department. Um, but I can tell you that if you present them to someone towards the end, the director, it's going to be very in a specific way because that's just how they're used to seeing it and that's just, you know, the specific way of how they can digest what you pitch in, a, in in their best way. Uh, and that's kind of, that's your job as an animator at a studio. You present things the way the client wants because they're the one paying for it, right? So there's, it's not you and you come up with your thing and you should adapt to my workflow. It's like, no, no, you're presenting to someone that pays for this and he or she wants to see in a specific way and that's what you do. So, you know, again, as you work, not again, but the more corporate your studio is, the more rules you're gonna have for sure. Um, but I don't see it as a problem. I don't see, it's not a problem for me. I don't see how 2D would be a problem presenting it to your coworkers, your leader, soup. Ultimately, you're still gonna have to present the whole thing in, in CG and 3D. Anyway, um, so yeah, I hope that answers the question. Natalie Van Roosmalen. Roosmalen? Roosmalen? Hey, Gene. It's not Gene. First of all, congratulations for the subs. Thank you. I'm only, dis I'm only discovered your videos two weeks ago and I love them. I would love to know how you did. I think I did ask you. Um, <laughs> but uh, spread the word. Anybody watching this and, and you think it's cool, spread the word, let people know. I would love to get more feedback. It's always cool. Thanks for all the hard work. You're very welcome. I learned a lot from them. That's awesome to hear. Thank you. I have a question about lip sync. As lip sync in 3D has a lot of controls, I kind of lose myself in them and don't know how to start. Do you have any tips on how to start and make it better? For sure. Um, so... Actually, again, I talked about lip sync yesterday in class. I got lots of thoughts and that's gonna be a very specific f &A, and I'm gonna keep it for that, but I'm gonna give you, like you said, a um, any tips on how to start. So what I do with lip sync is I do the Muppet test where I put my elbow on the table, whatever, and then I talk and I feel how big the accents are. So maybe it's something big and then something something small. So I know when the accents are on the jaw and that's my basic thing where I treat it like a Muppet. So they can get away with jaw, no eye blinks and no eyebrows. And it's basically, well, sometimes eyebrows, but sometimes you just have this, right? But you don't want to open the jaw for every sound. Every time you have that, it becomes this chattery skeleton jaw thing. It becomes too strobe and it's annoying to watch. It's distracting. So look at, like take your lip sync, analyze the intent behind everything. Like what, what part is important? What part is not important? What are the accents you really want to hit? So then you do your test and then you want to look at, well, what's the actual movement, okay? But maybe this, when I do this, it's too much. I'm just going to move my jaw here and here and the rest is done through shapes to kind of get this sound across. But you want to be um, a bit more economical in your jaw usage, right? So I do this, ba ba ba. Then I do corners, corners in and out for your E and U, for your extremes. So once you have that, you got your extremes for E and U um, or whatever sound, you know, shapes that you have for that. And then I go uh, M and F, and that's probably like two frames at least. I wouldn't do it over one frame, because then it kind of pops. So your mom and your fudge, um, that I would make sure that that's in there. And that to me is, that to me is 80%. You got your main accents, you got your extremes, you got your M for specific sounds. And after that, you're pretty good. And that's how I usually start. I usually start the shot doing exactly that. I don't, I don't do lip sync at the end. I do lip sync at the beginning with just that basic stuff. I don't look at corners in the mouth. I don't look at asymmetry. I don't look at this pushing up the cheeks and then the eyelids. I don't, that's at the end for me. But I want to know how the basic structure is of the lip sync so that when I act things out and I do a head move, is my jaw and lip movement reading during that fast move? Maybe during this fast move, I need to push the lips and the jaw more. But if you do just a, a lipstick cam or just like a, you know, like a GoPro cam with just the lip sync, it might look way too exaggerated, but in the actual move, it reads. So sometimes you have to push things or tone things down. That's why I hate cameras that are attached to the face. And when people critique that camera only for lip sync, 
Please don't do that because it's unrealistic, especially when the character looks away or is in profile. It's fine to look at it for general ideas of, okay, well, this is the general lip sync and that's the shape, okay, that's good, but I wouldn't go frame by frame and tweak that because it needs to be depending on the camera angle and depending on the action. But some people do it, I'm, I'm definitely not a fan of it because it's, a, to me, a waste of time because you're focusing on things that we don't see, especially if you start giving me notes about asymmetry on the shot that's like this. Come on, you don't see this side, so you're gonna work on pushing what you can see. But anyway, that's a whole different subject. So that to me is the, the tip, the general tip for how to start. Um, and with controls, like there are a lot of controls on, on good rigs, and most of the times you don't use all of them. Like, you know, you have your basic controls, your very basic emotions, and then you get into the details for specific moments, but I wouldn't touch them until the very end when you really have to. So you can get away with a lot of basic stuff. But the reason why I'm saying uh, I get away with that beginning is because to me, everything has to be in the eyes and eyebrows. And, you know, blinks and darts and eyebrows, there's so much in here. Also, because I'm a foreigner, I'm used to bad lip sync because I would watch movies that are dubbed. That's also, I'm so used to that. So I don't really care about lip sync that much. But you can get away with really crappy lip sync while the eyes are super expressive and it works. And ultimately, when I look at someone, be it CG or a live action human character, I look at eyes. I look at what, how they feel through that. I don't look at the lips. It'd be weird. So again, you can get away with this. And you can also do a test where... This is stupid, it'll be my FNA, but it's one of the things where sometimes you can do this, put something, this is way not transparent enough, but imagine you got something in front of your face like this, right? That's a plane. Uh, and I act things out, blah, 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 right? And then imagine everything reads still really well while you see this super clear, and this just kind of the basics. I just got a weird thing, I'll explain it in the FNA, but sometimes you can just push something, put something there that's kind of obscuring your face, but if it still works, you know you can get away with it, right? Doesn't that, your lip sync has to be detailed when it's really called for it, for specific shapes and ah, like you know, specific acting beats where you want that detail. But sometimes you just have a character doing something, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be all in here in the body. And sometimes you just have to worry about it. And especially if you're a close-up, sure. If it's a full body, far away body mo uh, motion shot, I don't really care about lip sync that much. I look at what are the moments, the key moments where maybe the face slows down and then I want to go into the facial stuff to really read. But when the character's back to jumping, I don't really care as much about the lip sync because no one's going to notice. That's subjectively what I do. Mohammed Mansour. Mansour, Mansur, Mansur, Mansur. Thank you for sharing your information. You're very welcome. In TV series animation, there is almost no time for reference and hardly enough time for proper blocking. When you when we have when we have to animate. Uh, about 200 frames a day, holy moly. What would be good workflow or any tips or tricks to get decent animation quality? That's really tricky because I don't really work in animation, so I'm not used to that workflow. I only worked on uh, Strange Magic that was a super compressed uh, time frame and Force Unleashed uh, cinematics for the first game. And that was basically your whole shot's done in a day type of thing. So I actually, then I go back to what I said before. I block things out every four frames, keep it as cleanly as it can. Uh, and if you don't have time, you know, sometimes you don't have time for overlap. You don't have time for all that detail. I just make sure that pose to pose, everything is as clear as possible. And if there are changes, you can just make that post change on that frame where everything is keyed on that frame. And if you have extra time, then go in there for overlaps and, you know, layered animation. Um, but that would be my, my approach. Because so you can get very... Um, limited animation because of the budget and time and everything that's still super clear like um pokoyo pokoyo i don't know how to pronounce it like it's very stylized very clean animation but it's super clear and it's super cute but it's very simple it's simple in terms of the complexities but it's not simple in terms of timing and and the intent like it's super cute and i love it uh, but you can get away with that minimal animation and it still communicates all the ideas i hope that makes sense so for me the good workflow would be be clean in your initial blocking. Don't key too many things, too many controls in a messy way. Just keep things clean so you have a fast and clean way to move your keys around and adjust the timing and potential acting choices. That would be my suggestion. Maurizio Bartok. By the way, this is question 21 and I think I have 28 questions. I might get this done. This might be a longer one, more than an hour. It would be good to finish this part three so I can move on with the regular FNAs. 
How do you keep your eyes fresh after working for days on the same shot? Do you use the mirror trick? It kind of works for me. Thank you for this great videos, for this great videos, especially the acting analysis. I also really like the critique for the Pixar intern. It's great when you show why something is good. Thank you so much. And you know, that, those are also very subjective because I nerd out on the animation stuff, but you know, I could be totally wrong. Um, and I definitely want to continue. I'm so late on these, especially the Spider-Man trailer and all those trailers that came out. I want to do this. So I'm glad you like them and I want to go back and do more of those. Now, how do you keep your eyes fresh? Do you use the mirror trick? Yes. Thank you for this. Uh, that's your question. That's my answer. <laughs> but anyway, how do I keep my eyes fresh? So a couple of things, the mirror trick for sure. Also, asking other people for feedback, very important. Um, also, working on multiple shots. So you work on the shot and you get tired of it, move on to the other shot. Work on that and you get tired of that. Get back to your other shot. Oh, clean eyes, mm, that's interesting. Something doing, moving things backwards in reverse. It sounds super silly because the time is gonna be totally off. But every now and then I do something in reverse and it kind of, I don't know, it, it, some things get highlighted like, hmm, that's interesting and then play it back. Okay, maybe I understand it's not, often, but every now and then I just try to tweak things or mix things up in terms of how I look at it. Um, but definitely reverse, not reverse, uh, mirror in terms of reverse, right? You, you flop the plate. So I use the mirror trick. I definitely have the shot that I work on and something else and I go back. Also super important, when you play blast, try to put your shot in between other shots. So other stuff you've done or other people's stuff, but you look at something, your shot shows up, shot is done. Because there's a, a tricky thing about when you do a play blast or an A blast, whatever you, you know your, your, your render thing is called, the movie comes up and it's not playing and you're stuck on the first frame and you have seconds, unless you're distracted, minutes to look at that first frame and you can soak in, these are the characters, that's the environment, that's the general layout, I get it, play until it stops. And you know, the last frame, okay, I get it, that's the last post, blah, blah, blah. But that's not how it works. That's not how people see it. You have to understand and realize, and especially be disciplined about that, that your shot starts and ends, and there's something before and after. So you have to make sure that when your shot starts, that it's clear right away. So within the first six or seven frames, or six to eight frames, whatever it is, I kind of like say seven frames, the first seven frames have to be clear. I wouldn't introduce something super fast on the first seven frames because you'll miss it because you are still kind of getting, soaking in all the information of this is the shot, that's the camera, the characters, the layout, the environment, I get it. Now I can pay attention. So first seven frames, don't do anything crazy fast, but you'll miss it. Also, the last seven frames don't add anything because you're starting an idea, but there's no, there's no resolve, there's no finish. You're just starting something new, then we cut out and it can be either jarring or confusing. So beginning and the end, be super clear and then in between, you know, do your thing. So I try to not loop things over and over and over unless it's for polish. So I gotta look at the arcs and spacing and timing up. I loop and loop and loop. But every now and then look at 10 seconds of something else, then your shot, 10 seconds of something else. So you know that, does my shot work when you just get thrown into it and get pulled out of it? That's a big thing. Uh, and especially when you have something where a shot is like 25 frames long and you loop and loop and loop and loop. So that's not how people see the shot. Your shot, there's other stuff, your shot gone and the rest. So you gotta focus on what is the fastest, clearest read on the shot. <laughs> and the audience is not gonna loop it. I'm ranting for specific people and no one's gonna watch this anyway, I'll get fired. But be careful when you have short shots, don't loop them. You can loop them for polish, but Play them within a sequence in context so you understand, does this work? Anyway, that's it. That's kind of my answer. Uh, Le Mainstream. Question. How to get in contact with other animators to be inspired and fired up, to exchange tips, to learn from each other online and offline? That's a good question that I cannot answer uh, for you because it depends on who you are and where you live. That's a weird answer, but hear me out. If you are super shy and introverted, you might have a hard time getting onto like CTN and SIGGRAPH just to kind of schmooze around and make contact. So that's going to be a problem. If you're in a different country and you have to fly or travel, however, to CTN and SIGGRAPH or whatever, you know, FMA, whatever convention you have, a GDC, you might not have the financial resources to do that. That's also a problem. So I totally get this. Um, so you might be just stuck online. Um, so... If you have the financial means and the travel means, 
uh, I would network like that. I would go to places where other animators are and just strike up a conversation, ask ask for feedback on your reel. Just don't be too slimy. And you're like, hey, I want to be your buddy and I want to get feedback because I want to work where you work type of thing. It's a fine line. Um, but try to just be surrounded by like-minded people. If it's in class, maybe you have a lab where people work in the evenings or whatever and you can go there and then exchange ideas there uh, uh, to get fired up, right? Um, but if it's only online, Try to find forums where people post things and then comment. And this could be on Facebook, could be Twitter, could be specific animation forums where you can post your things or just comment and maybe get some relationships through that. Um, for me, in, in terms of getting tips and getting fired up, I am on Twitter a ton. So if you have a Twitter account, actually, if you don't, create one. You don't have to use it. You don't have to post, I'm eating a sandwich now, even though I post stupid stuff like that too. Um, just create an account, follow animators, Follow companies, follow the HR departments of companies. They got tons of tips on how to create reels and things. Um, but just follow people who do animation in terms of cartoony VFX, games, or whatever it is, right? And if you follow me, moi, uh, I try to retweet as much as I can if I have time to, to go on Twitter. Um, you can go through my feed and you can see I try to retweet all the cool stuff that I see across the board. So games, VFX, cartoon, whatever it is. And it gets me fired up. So this is not just for you, but this is for me personally as well. I'm very selfish where I look at this and I want to look at that and I want to, you know, do a collection of things that I can go back to later on. Like that was a cool move where someone just recently posted something about there's a pose and there's a pose after that and do three different versions to go from this pose to that end pose. And it's, I think something that he had students do. Um, and it was super cool to see the approach of the three different things. Um, and the one thing I want to do and I haven't done it yet, I'm still... Not sure if I should do it. Like every Monday, I would do, I think the, the name was, or we, through help from our animators, uh, was Animation Minute. And within one minute, I highlight all the best things that I saw that week and maybe uh, maybe a bit longer than a minute. And that's kind of the recap of the week. And then I post that in video form so you can see what it is. But I also post that on my blog, on the Spongella blog. So you have the links to all the awesome things that I see. So if you are not on Twitter and you just want to check once a week, what was the cool stuff that happened this week? It would be a uh, summary in a way, like a recap. And many sites do that in terms of, you know, trailer news or just our movie news or whatever, like a recap of the week. And I think that could be kind of interesting if I keep it to just one minute. It's not too much work for me either because I don't want to just get bogged down with too much stuff. Um... If that's something you guys like, maybe comment, maybe let me know. Do you want Do you want this? Um, I like it because I I retweet and like on Twitter so that if I just go on my likes, I have my whole list of things that I want to do, uh, watch again and then just look at for inspiration. But maybe if it's also in a more structured each week on a blog with a tag, it might be better. Or even, like I said, on YouTube once a week on Mondays, you can just watch that and get fired up by things, you know, one after the other as a little package of, of awesomeness. So I don't know. Let me know. Uh, I'm still leaning towards I'm going to do this. Um, so I don't know. Let me know if everybody says it's a stupid idea. I won't do it. I want to waste people's time. I won't waste my time either. But I feel like I want to do it even just for myself. So I don't know. I'm I'm wrestling with it. Let me know. What do you think? Good question though. Wait, did I answer your question? So how in contact? Okay. Um, yeah, actually one more thing. Sometimes you can just email people or just contact them through Twitter or Instagram, whatever it is. Like sometimes you have questions. Does Ask them. I think uh, so many people have answered my questions or uh, I know of people who do that. Like It's just everybody wants to be helpful. I remember one thing I did way, way, way back in school. I did a, um, a let's say someone calling me here. No. Um, so way, way, way back in school, I did a, uh, I Googled at ILM.com and at Pixar.com. So two companies I wanted to work for. Uh, and I found animator emails <laughs> And I cold emailed them. I said, hey, I found your email. I searched for your email. I found it here. Here's my reel. Do you have any any advice, any help? And I tried to be as polite as I could. Uh, and everybody responded. Um, some were laughing, like, how did you find my email? But everybody responded and helped and critiqued things. And I remember, I actually don't remember. I don't remember who it was. If it was Victor Navone or Cameron Miyazaki. So if anybody listens to this work camp or knows someone, I don't know if they ask, they don't care. Um, but that was my experience. It was one of the, the two. I emailed them, one of the two. Uh, and they answered, yeah, send me your stuff. And I sent three things. I sent, I believe it was a weight assignment, probably some acting piece and something else. I remember sending three more simpler things, like a weight, something, I don't know, three things. And I wrote, hey, you probably uh, 
get these a lot. Here are three things so you can choose from so that you don't always have to, if you've done 10 weight assignment critiques already today, because uh, probably everybody's emailing you, here's maybe something else you wanna do. But I think my email was worded horribly. I don't know what I wrote. I'm not gonna have the excuse of I'm ESL and Swiss, but maybe it was just bad. He got mad. <laughs> he said, dude, I said, one clipper, you're sending me three. So he was not happy about it. But then guess what? He critiqued it anyway. One page for each shot that I sent. Even though I, you know, I, one would have been okay. Despite the attitude, you know, like me going, hey, show me everything, like tell me everything. No, that's, he was still massively helpful and generous with his time and critiqued every single shot full page. And it helped a ton. And this is the reason why, why I do this. That interaction was for me always the cornerstone of if I know anything, the minimal amount of knowledge that I have in animation, and I can help even just one person, be it in my class, be it online, then that to me is worth it. Because I got help, I got help for free. They didn't have, they didn't, they didn't need to take the time to help me, but they did. And it did help me a ton. And I wouldn't be here without the people helping me. So at least that I can do is, again, with my limited knowledge, pay forward. And, and if it's helpful, then that's great. If it's just one person, then that's great. And maybe one, one day I don't have time anymore. I don't have the energy anymore to do it. And then I just stop. But so far, I like doing it. And I really like teaching. Uh, and if it's helpful, and my class yesterday is so much fun at the academy. I love being in a classroom and talking to people and explaining things and, and hopefully seeing that light bulb go on and like they're, they're, they're getting it. It's just really a lot of fun. But I do have to credit all the people that helped me and especially whoever it was at Pixar that decided to answer and critique every shot, even though they were not supposed to or that's not what I asked for. So whoever ever hears this, thank you for having done that. It, it definitely uh, helped me and influenced me a ton. So contact and animators, just cold email them, cold contact them, Twitter or Instagram. And the worst thing they can do is not answer or say no, don't have the time because they probably don't have the time because people are busy. But then that's, then so be it. Then just ask someone else. But chances are someone is gonna answer. Uh, and if you have emailed me, and I know I get emails on my specific email for feedback, um, I don't always answer right away because I gotta answer the students that you know that I teach now that pay for things and and you know like that's kind of my my uh, what the the priority list. But I have people that have uh, emailed me a long time ago, months and months ago, and I do get back to them. The worst one was probably two years later I emailed, but I do eventually get back to everybody. But I apologize if it's really really late and I have a long list, but. Keep emailing me. If, when I have time, I'll get to it. Of course, it's not always right away and it's probably too late by now for some people. Um, but I have no problem with that and I just get to it when I can. But do that. Just email people. You know, they will. if they have the time, they'll answer. So that would be my very long answer to your one simple question. All right. John Michael Steele. Uh, this is from a different place. Uh, I'm not sure if you already covered this, but maybe something about how you plan lip sync. I was thinking about when you have a character that isn't human, and so the mouth might be shaped differently. If a dragon talks, or a robot, or a creature, do you approach a lip sync differently, or is that more a technical thing about how you make those shapes, and so something that you would think about more in the production bit? When I watched Smaug talking, I wonder if the animator was actually making the poses to strengthen or show the mouth shapes because they are so good and his lip sync is so clear. I wondered if this is a part of the planning of that type of shot. Thanks again for doing these videos. You're very welcome. Uh, that's a good question, a very specific question about work. Um, so I will definitely do something about lip sync, but that's an interesting tweak on this, when a character that isn't human, so the mouth might be shaped differently. So I would look at, if it's a character with just the beak, for instance, you can, again, you can get away a ton with just like Muppet style, rah, 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 with just the jaw stuff. So I would look at what's the anatomy of the creature and what it's going to read as much. But also if you have something, it's, pretend you have an alligator and you know, like the lips, like everything goes, it doesn't have lips, alligator doesn't have lips. Uh, if everything goes back from the mouth all the way back here, having a ooh and e that might just take too long and be super weird for that shape to go all the way back. So that would just simplify as much as you can you kind of hit the main M, F, E, U, just to kind of get that contrast in shapes um, and just do a lot with the head and hit accents in combination of that. So that's how we do it. Um, and especially if it's creatures and it's photo real, like smoke stuff, where it's just, you want to be very careful not to go super, super detail, where just there's too much moving. You can still 
get away with stylizing and simplifying things. Um, do you approach a lip sync differently? So yeah, that would be my approach. I look at potentially the simplifying things and just hitting certain moments in a more detailed way. So it looks more real and complex because of the style, but then try to cheat other areas to be more simple just to get away with it because otherwise it gets too convoluted and too, too messy. Um, when I was watching uh, Smaug, so I was, I'm not working at Weta, I didn't animate Smaug, so you would have to uh, ask a Weta animator uh, specifically for those tips, um, but I'm sure that they have a specific plan of it, look at reference, act things out themselves, um, but you're asking, I wonder if this is part of the planning. Um, for me it is, yes, again, I can't speak for other animators, but I definitely try to plan out, even in my reference of well, how would this creature move, for instance, if you have, I didn't work on Warcraft, but they have the tusk, the thing is coming out, you know, it probably would be helpful to put something in your mouth so that when you act things out and say the lines that, you know, you're, you're overcompensating because there is something in your mouth. So if you do have a creature with something specific or a lisp or something in their mouth, maybe they're eating, that's part of my process of, of the planning. I, I try to emulate the character as much as I can. So if something is in their mouth, I should reference with something in my mouth so that the shapes are different and it, it will, it will, you know, it will potentially, if anything is in here, maybe I talk with my head tilted this way to camera more because I know this is messy here and I want to be clear in what I say with this side. Maybe that my whole acting is, is you know, influenced by that. And that's what I really stress upon when you do your reference is that your reference should be as close, should be as close as you can to the final result in terms of eye line, props. If it's someone bigger, put put uh, you know pillows in your in under your jacket so that your range of motion is limited so that you don't have to you don't act something out and then your character is totally different and you just kind of do a guessing game and then what's the point like to me is try to reference to to structure the reference and do your reference so that it really works with the character and it's you know as similar as possible and again if there's something in your mouth then I put something in my mouth because that might force a change in my acting because of a head tilt or whatever. There's maybe something in your mouth that's hanging out so then I would tilt my head this way all the time so that what's hanging is here and not drooping and, and resting on my on my clavicle here. So again, it's just like every circumstance in terms of size and costume or heat or cold or something you eat is going to influence your acting choices. So I would always think about that and have that in your planning before you do anything. At least me, again, this is very subjective. Nessa Godinez. Godinez, Godinez, Godinez. I know this is probably one of the most frequently asked for topics, but will you be covering how to pose animate hands? I still struggle with those. No one has asked for this, so this is the least frequently asked topic. <laughs> but yes, I definitely want to do an FNA about posing, and that will include hands. Um, I struggle with those as well, but I have a printout of all the classic hand poses and again depending on the style like what are you know, the classic you know triangle type of things to keep it clean but that in live action movie might feel too posed so you want to keep it a bit messier again it depends on your style um i'm a massive fan of um brave and tangled in terms of hand poses there's some beautiful stuff in there so i usually just look at movies and maybe you know screenshot certain scenes and and you kind of keep that in the folder of reference um, but there's a ton of stuff on my blog, on the Spongella blog. I believe I have stuff tagged on their hands uh, where I, I have multiple posts about hands where people post a reference photos, either real hands or cartoony hands, a collection of like Merlin hand poses or whatever it is, Disney stuff. Um, so I can definitely talk about that. Uh, I definitely have my own library of hand poses and I, I recommend that you do that too until you don't struggle. But after a while, after looking at those same poses over and over and over, a, you will be able to pose them out quickly um, and also know what to avoid. Like this hand pose is Harada somewhere is, is hating me, but this is usually for politicians. They kind of, they have, like politicians frequently do this hand pose for whatever reason. Um, so like for me, I look at, is this pose appropriate for the character in the, in the moment? Uh, or is this something that's overused and I don't use it? Um, so I definitely have a, a reference library of these are the hand poses and I plug those in and then I tweak them from there. Because you don't want to just put them in and that's what everybody does, because then it looks cliche. Maybe there's a tweak that you can do. But in terms of just general tip, try to not be overcomplicated with shapes, like something like this. This might work in live action if Christopher Lee or Dooku or Saruman does this type of thing and he has you know crazy fingers and it's cool. Also, it's real, we don't care, because it's just, that's a real person. 
But if it's a silhouette and cartoony stuff, like this would be just way too convoluted. Try to simplify, you know, how, how far do you have to go to really simplify, simplify a pose to just a clean triangle? It, again, depends on the style, and depends on what the shot um, is asking for. Maybe the person has finger problems, and that's the whole point, that the fingers are always bent like this, because it almost adds an element of pain every time that characters on scene or in the shot, you know, maybe that's the whole point. And then your your poses have to be as clean as you can while holding this pose. I mean, like, again, it depends on the acting choice and the intent. So hopefully that answers the question. Austin, do we finally get to see an example of the tentacle animation you always suggest for everyone's creature animation? I don't know, maybe, but Skull Island came uh, is the closest to what I always wanted to do in terms of, but I didn't work on that movie, where um, Kong is struggling with the tentacle things and ripping them apart. I, I believe uh, Alberto, um, he has a post online as well. He did a, a, um, he posted his reel with all the awesome shots he did on Skull Island. But I always tell my students, I would love to do a creature shot where two creatures are fighting and it's not, it's like two bigger creatures could be whatever, right? So let's say two gorillas, but like fantasy creatures on a surface, sand or something with slippage because it's an uneven surface. Then they kind of keep finding into a swamp. So you have a change of elements. So from something that's kind of slippery into like a sticky swamp thing, and that will force a change in their me body mechanics. And then once they start fighting, suddenly a tentacle comes out and then picks one of the guys and one of the creatures and pulls them into it and the other creature goes back. I always wanted to do that type of combination of two complex fighting things going from surface to another surface and then one more tentacle thing taking someone on the water or into the swamp. I always wanted to do that. But I tell my students all the time, uh, that would be cool and I always suggest that when they say, what should we do? I always say, don't always stick to humans, do creatures and you know cartoony stuff. Um, but if you do VFX stuff, that would be such a cool shot. I always mention it, I've never done it. Um, and yeah, I didn't work on Skull Island, I was bummed because they did actually that. It would have been so cool, full circle. But anyway, Carlos Moreno, do vids on how to make nice looking background for the animations. Uh, render tricks, basic modeling, texture tricks, uh, I don't know. So, Carlos, and you know this, I always make fun of you, but don't ask questions like this, do vids. Like, you know, please, do please, and I'm not offended by this, but this goes into a general thing of, when you try to make connections with other people, so when you're so, uh, at SIGGRAPH or CTN or something and you're asking someone, say, could you please blah, 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 you know, have the general social um, respect uh, and don't just go do this and do that. Again, I know you, I know you personally, I'm not, like, that's not how I'm taking it. But for anybody that will post something and ask someone they don't know, it's not, that comes just off as very strong, like how about when I have time? Like that's, that might be an answer, right? Um, that's a, a, a non-answer to this, right? But in terms of networking, going by the previous question, as you find someone online or in real life, just also be mindful that they might get a ton of questions and they might be tired and exhausted. Um, just always make sure that, you know, just be as polite as you can um, because you never know what that person went through that day. So just kind of be professional and courteous in general. It's a general thing about that. In terms of nice looking backgrounds, so, I will definitely talk about this in my third chapter, was now I'm starting part two in terms of um, animation tricks and demos and workflows and, and all that hands-on stuff. And my third one is gonna be about uh, render tricks, you know, like viewport 2.0 type of things or, or a specific render setup. Or if you say basic modeling and texture tricks, for me it would be, I wouldn't do a character in front of a, a photo, a real photo, because then you have stylized designs and simple colors in front of a very complex background and that clashes and it's too busy and it might muddy your silhouette. For, for me, it would be the tip would be clean backgrounds where you might have a photo, but then just add geometry on top of that to kind of emulate what the photo was and so it's CG in front of CG uh, and the style is the same. Um, basic modeling in terms of maybe you can find, uh, I have a texture, not I have, but there's a, like a, a starter pack that someone posted with sets a model that you can just use and maybe put your creature or your human in that set and that's your background. So I would say find assets, find assets online where you can use that so you don't have to spend time on basic modeling um, and then render tricks. I would definitely try to find a way to get lighting in there so do you have cast shadow. Mainly because if someone is walking or jumping or something that bounces, whatever it is, the cast shadow is gonna help show the audience when something's in the air, the shadow is here and then contact. And something, some movements without shadowing can be weird to look at, can be tricky. 
Um, same with if you do big camera moves and your plane is just a, a simple plane, you don't know if the character is moving or the camera is moving. So I would have elements on the grounds. If it's somewhere outside, have some grass things or like a branch or a couple stones so that when the camera moves, stuff is moving towards camera and you see a, a perspective change and it's just a clear understanding of what the camera is doing. So, but those are the things um, you might argue that you should think about before you start the shot. Uh, but that's something that you maybe you haven't done and it's something that looks weird or that's just in your presentation. And that will be the third block where I talk about that for sure. Um, so yeah, that would be that. All right, so um, two more questions. Anil Mah Maharian, Maharian. Hello, Jean. Thank you very much for sharing the videos. You're very welcome. My question is, what would you suggest to the beginner animation student like me who is practicing animation by their own? What are the things that need to be followed regarding the animation exercises or are there any suggestions from your side? I did a clip about, uh, and I think I actually responded to this with the link to like what exercises would you do? Um, so I definitely did that. Um, so I would look at that list for sure. And beginner animation students were practicing animation on their own. The big thing would be feedback. So post your stuff wherever you can, be it Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, forums, where, wherever you can, uh, or show it to people in real life. Um, so you get feedback. That's the biggest thing. You can't start out and be in a vacuum and then you can't um, get feedback. You just don't know what's good or what's not good. So my main answer would be show it to as many as you can, many people as you can for feedback. Um, and then I posted the, the list of exercises and just go through basic stuff. And it's important that you just do exercises and because not every shot has to be for your real and very fleshed out. Sometimes it's just movement, just do like 10 head turns or a couple jumps or a couple sit downs. So my thing would be share for feedback and repetition. Just do things over and over and over to get into a habit of it and the mental you know, habit and then the, the muscle memory and mental memory of doing something. And you will start to recognize the patterns, the curves in your graph editor. Um, so that would be, that would be my suggestion on that side. And I believe this is the last question. One piece by Isobar, Isobar. Hmm? Hello, Gene. It's not Gene. How are you? I'm great. Uh, please, can you explain to us how you are doing to know exactly where to place good breakdowns in over shots between two keys? Okay. And also help us in the orientation for the demo reel for different studio. Thank you for all do all you do. God bless you. Uh, well, thank you. And yes, the demo reel stuff is going to, going to be in the future, the third block. And then how to know exactly where to place good breakdowns and overshoots. Uh, that's kind of what I talked about before. So it would be, um, I would look at intent and the acting choices and the character emotion in terms of, like you have a pose and a pose and your breakdowns are going to be what will tell us how the character feels going from A to B or what the intent is from A to B. If someone is freaking out or doing it slowly or a quick gesture, whatever it is, for me, where to place it is not a technical thing to me. It is more, well, it can be a technical if it's overshoot and more overlap, the more technical that aspect. But for me, it's always, everything has to always be in service of the character and the acting choices in the story points. So where to place them, you place them where they will explain and tell and, co and communicate the story point and the acting choices the, in the clearest way, in the, you know, the clearest fashion. So I, I'm not sure if that's a, a very helpful answer, but to me, there's no mathematical thing of breakdowns. It's, it's the breakdowns and ease ins and outs. Do you want to hold this for this long? If, if I look, my general example is always look for this and do that or do that. So where you put the breakdowns and ease ins and outs to hold this and to go over there, all depends on the intention and the acting choice. So for me, it's not technical. It's more what's the, you know, what's the motivation of the character. Um, but it's still true, and that's how I would um, approach it. I still got time. I'm looking at, you know, when my recording will stop. But that's it. It's going to be one of the longer ones probably. But that's it. I don't see any more questions. That's all I saved. Um, if you do have any more questions, let me know and I will do a follow up in a month or two with a brand new Q&A and I will, I will definitely post something of now it's time for questions again. So maybe wait till then. It's totally up to you. I will save your any additional questions. Uh, again, this was probably a, a very long clip. If you watch the whole thing again, 
Thank you so much. Thank you for watching these. Uh, thank you for asking questions. Thank you for subscribing. It's awesome to see the feedback and it tells me uh, if this is you know helpful or not. That's great. Uh, if you like this, like this. That helps me too. It gets, I get to see you know, if this is, was something I should continue or not. And of course, subscribe if you haven't because I post stuff every day. So hit that bell button so you get notifications about everything I do so you don't miss anything because you never know how YouTube, whatever, tells you what's going on and where the uploads are. So that bell button is going to help you with that. And that is it. So this is the end of part three of all the Q and A's. Next week, I'm going to continue with part two, the second block of my FNA and uh, acting tips for animators. All right. Thank you for watching.